So, let's say you wanted to write a murder mystery. How would you go about it? Ryan Johnson follows in the footsteps of Agatha Christie with his two movies, Knives Out, and the subject of this video, Glass Onion. And for me, this goes back to the original source of inspiration for all of this, which is my love of Agatha Christie's work and her books. She was coming into each one with a totally different conceptual approach, and she was trying twists and turns and narrative gambits, and she was subverting the tropes of the genre from the very start. It's not a secret that Johnson explicitly based his movies on the works of Agatha Christie, the pre-definite mystery author, as Miles Braun would say. That's a, that's a reference to the movie, Glass Onion. I, I've got the pre-definite detective in the world at my murder mystery party. That is so legit. Glass Onion is reminiscent of the book And Then There Were None, if only for the premise of ten people being trapped on an island with the fear of being murdered one by one. Following in Christie's footsteps, Johnson abides by the three rules required to write any mystery, those rules being 1. Withhold, 2. Chekhov's gun, and 3. The red herring. And just a heads up, spoilers for Glass Onion and for Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None lay ahead. But before we get into those rules, let's talk about the basis for the mystery, that being the crime that needs to be solved. Detective fiction is actually a subgenre of a larger group known as crime fiction. Other subgenres in the category include courtroom drama and legal thrillers. Sometimes these subgenres cross, and most stories within the crime genre as a whole contain a mystery element. But to write a mystery, there must of course be a crime. There are two major ways to make a crime interesting. One is to make the crime seem so impossible that no one could have done it, a route taken by Christie in And Then There Were None. The second way, and the route taken by Johnson, is rather than make the crime impossible, make it so possible that everyone's a suspect. Like, for example, turning off the lights while a gun is easily available to anyone. So once your crime is all laid out, let's talk about how to turn it into a true mystery, as opposed to any other subgenre of crime fiction. Rule number one, withhold the truth through careful selection of detail. In literature, selection of detail is a term we use to refer to the minor things that an author chooses to include in their text, things that seem innocuous or irrelevant, but actually speak volumes. For example, take the first sentence in And Then There Were None, in the corner of a first-class smoking carriage, Mr. Justice Wargrave, lately retired from the bench, puffed at a cigar, and ran an interested eye through the political news in the Times. The selection of detail here is off the charts. Almost all of the moving pieces in the sentence are character revelations. Wargrave sits in the corner of a first-class smoking carriage, puffing at a cigar and running an interested eye through a political publication. All of these details seem very generalized, but the more you look at them and the more you read the story, the more they make sense. Selection of detail, however, isn't only used to tell the audience something, but also to do just the opposite. Ryan Johnson makes his audience think one way because he's only showing us certain details. There are so many instances of this within Knives Out, and especially in Glass Onion. Like when Helen opens Miles' box with a hammer. The audience thinks she's just being efficient, but later, when Johnson starts to peel back the layers, we realize that Helen didn't actually know how to open the box. This is all part of the larger project of the story. Up until the halfway point, the audience is led to believe that the crime to be solved is the murder of Miles Braun, and so the audience has been paying attention to details related to that crime, and not the actual crime at hand, Andy's murder. In a way, as a writer, you really do have to gaslight your audience. For example, when Duke is apparently poisoned, Miles convinces everyone that Duke took his glass by mistake, and were shown just as much. But eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that wasn't what happened at all. Miles handed Duke his own glass. If you'll notice, Johnson is even distracting us in this scene with Bertie's spinning dress. It really is like how a magician misdirects their audience to pull off their trick. But, while you gaslight your audience, what you absolutely cannot do is completely pull the rug out from under them. The answer must have been in plain sight the whole time, to the point that a reader could guess the conclusion. Minor spoiler for Pretty Little Liars right now. I've never watched Pretty Little Liars, but I know about it because of how absolutely terrible the twists were. If I'm not wrong, the final bad guy was revealed to be the evil twin of one of the main characters, a character who was never broadcasted to the audience as even having existed. You might be saying, didn't Johnson do the whole twin thing as well? Yes. However, that twist came at the middle of the story. Had it come at the end, yeah, that would have been dumb. But it's not THE twist. Just like in Knives Out, how there's a reveal after Act 1, but it's not the final reveal. So, in essence, withhold from your audience through selection of details. Gaslight them, misdirect them, but don't come from out of nowhere. Just as Benoit says, a glass onion has layers, but layers you can see through.
Look into the clear center of this glass onion. Rule number two, Chekhov's gun. Studio Binder actually has a great video where they break down the use of Chekhov's gun in Knives Out, but basically, Russian playwright Anton Chekhov said, if in the first act you have hung a pistol on the wall, then in the following one it should be fired. Otherwise, don't put it there. That is to say, make sure every element of your story has a point. Agatha Christie is perhaps the quintessential mystery author because she's so good at this. Her stories are compact, there's no fluff whatsoever within the mystery. It's really to the point that, and then there were none, becomes nearly unsolvable because of just how little there is for the audience to work with on the surface. She leaves nothing within the story that doesn't need to be there. This is a good writing tip in general, by the way. If you want to make your story better, see which 10% you'd delete from it. Challenge yourself to find what doesn't truly need to be there. Johnson is the same way. Everything in his story has a point, even if it doesn't seem to at first. One of my favorite examples is this. Ma, where's my spear gun? I got a pack. Babe, get pack. It comes off as a joke, but the spear gun comes back later when Whiskey uses it to nearly kill Helen. Is that a spear gun? A more prominent example would be... No pineapple on that, right? Duke don't dance with pineapple. There's no pineapple. Again, because this comes off as a joke, the audience doesn't take any stock in it, and by the time that information would be necessary, nearly everyone has forgotten about it. Granted, this is easier to do in a movie than in a book, because movies can trick the audience through editing, framing, music, and all sorts of other plays. This, in my opinion, is why Johnson can rapid-fire these Chekhov's guns, the hot sauce, the kombucha, the baby blue car, the literal gun on Duke's belt, etc., and so forth. This, in my opinion, is one of the neatest examples. If you're going to litter your set with glass sculptures in Act 1, they'd better shatter by Act 3. Of course, you may think, but there were plenty of things in Glass Onion that had no payoff. And that brings us to rule number three, the red herring. A red herring in literature is something that misleads or distracts the audience, and perhaps leads them to a false conclusion. As you could probably tell at this point, these three rules are heavily intertwined, and while a red herring may not be necessary to withhold information from the audience as rule number one states, it certainly aids you in your attempts to distract. And then there were none is very upfront in the fact that it has a red herring. On the seventh line of the nursery rhyme that the story is based on, it says, Four little soldier boys going out to sea, a red herring swallowed one, and then there were three. The characters in the book even note how explicit the reference is, and realize they're somehow being misled within the story itself. While Glass Onion's red herrings aren't so overt, one of my favorites is the inclusion of Daryl. Hey, hey! Hey, bro. Not here. Who's that? That's Daryl. He's, he's just staying here, he's going through some things, but he's not part of the experience at all. This again plays with our preconceived notions of mystery stories. We know that mysteries have colorful casts, so if you're like me, when you saw Glass Onion you probably thought Daryl would be a key piece in the story. But no. That said, he does still have a payoff, one of comedic effect. And even though he's not part of the story in the way that we might assume, he does his job as a red herring in distracting from the larger narrative. Disruption. <laughs> so, just to recap, the three rules for turning your crime into a mystery are 1. Withhold information through selection of detail. 2. Chekhov's gun. Make sure there are no superfluous details unless their express purpose lay in 3. The red herring. Don't just withhold, but actively make your audience look in the wrong direction. But hey, I'm no genius writer by any stretch. What rules did I miss? While I mentioned the strategic placement of twists and the use of a colorful cast, maybe those ideas are so crucial that they should be rules themselves. This simple thing that you thought you were looking at, it suddenly takes on layers and depth so complex, it gives you vertigo. Seriously, go read and then there were none. It's so good. I really tried to spoil as little as possible here so that you can read it, so please, go do it.